listening to Give God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. Why do I have to choose? Why do I have to choose to see everybody lose, to walk around and sing the blues? Well, darling, I refuse. Those are the opening lyrics to an old Willie Nelson song. And, um, (laughs) you know, he wrote those to describe a love that had grown cold. And the writer asked, why do I choose to be so sad? Why do I have to go through all of these motions uh, and be miserable? Hello, everyone. Thank you for choosing wisely, I hope, and being blessed by what we have to say tonight. Um, My name is Jerry Mitchell, your host for Give God 90. Sitting in her supervisor's chair is Myra. Hello, everyone. And as uh, we look tonight at some interesting things, I want to remind Everyone who uh, usually listens, that uh, the website is still there for all the new people, too. The website's up. Uh, If you go to GiveGod90.com, check us out there. Uh, There's a couple books available. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, Tradition. I always want to start with the second one first. Tradition to Truth and One uh, One Man's Search for Honest Answers and God's Universe, God's Rules are currently available. Uh, if you like what you hear, we appreciate you know the likes, the shares. The chat room is open if you want to leave us a comment. Myra spoke to somebody the other day and said, you know, I, I listen to you. Uh, I don't usually listen live. I listen on my way to and from work. So if you're driving, you know, don't interact with your phone while you're driving. Okay? So, you know, that's not a good idea. Never a good idea. Pay but attention you, to the road. But you can listen. You can listen. <laughs> if you're flying an airplane, I really hope you're not interacting with your phone anyway. Uh, just listen. It'll be okay. But if you so choose to leave us a comment or a message, you know, we will get it whenever uh, it shows up. I will get a, a notification that says, hey, somebody left you a message, and I'll check it out. The, the Bible is full of examples about making choices. You know, some good choices, some bad choices. Samson, for instance, made some really bad choices, didn't he? You know, so did Jonah for a while. So did Saul, King Saul. So did David. And even Judas in the New Testament made a really, really poor decision. A necessary decision, but a poor decision. The one thing that each of these all bad decisions have in common is one thing very simple. Each person, when they made bad decisions, failed to follow the Creator's instructions. That's important to remember. If you look back on your life, I would imagine that you can remember some choices that you probably made and when you really think about them and you look way down deep all of the bad choices you made probably came from not following the creator's instructions maybe you didn't know it at the time maybe you didn't know those instructions at the time but you can probably trace every instance of a bad choice back to failing to follow his basic instructions. And it's all because we don't really know the way we're designed to live in some instances. And when we don't know that, we become self-destructive to some degree. You know, it's it's not always, you know, you're going to explode like, you know, the movies, right? It's set to self-destruct. That's not how it has to be. But if you really think about all of your bad choices, chances are all of them are centered around not doing the things that 
the Creator designed you to do. And we're going to look at an example of someone that we don't often think about who made a poor decision. Meyer's going to start reading uh, beginning in Numbers 22. Then the people of Israel went to the plains of Moab. They camped near the Jordan River across from Jericho. Balak, son of Zippor, saw everything the Israelites had done to the Amorites. And Moab was scared of so many Israelites. Truly, Moab was terrified by them. The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, This mob will take everything around us. It will be like an ox eating grass. Balak, son of Zippor, was the king of Moab at this time. He sent messengers to Balaam, son of Beor and Pethor. It was near the Euphrates River in the land of Ammo. Balak said, A nation has come out of Egypt. They covered the land. They have camped next to me. They are too powerful for me, so come and put a curse on them. Maybe then I can defeat them and make them leave the area. I know that if you bless someone, the blessings happen, and if you put a curse on someone, it happens. The elders of Moab and Midian went to the went with payment in their hands. They found Balaam. Then they told him that what Balak had said. Balaam said to them, Stay here for the night. I will tell you what the Lord tells me. So the Moabite leaders stayed with him. God came to Balaam and asked, Who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, The king of Moab, Balak son of Zippor, sent them. He sent me this message. A nation has come out of Egypt. They cover the land. So come and put a curse on them. Then maybe I can fight them and force them out of my land. But God said to Balaam, Do not go with them. Do not put a curse on those people. I have blessed them. The next morning, Balaam woke and said to Balak's leader, Go back to your own country. The Lord will not let me go with you. So the Moabite leaders went back to Balak. They said, Balaam refused to come with us. So Balak sent other leaders. He sent more leaders this time, and they were more important. They went to Balaam and said, Balak, son of Zippor, says this, Please don't let anything stop you from coming to me. I will pay you well. I will do what you say. Come and put a curse on these people for me. But Balaam answered Balak's servants, King Balak could give me his palace full of silver and gold, but I cannot disobey the Lord my God in anything, great or small. You stay here tonight, as the other men did. I will find out what more the Lord tells me. That night God came to Balaam. He said, These men have come to ask you to go with them. Go, but only do what I tell you. Balaam got up the next morning. He put a saddle on his donkey. Then he went with the Moabite leaders. But God became angry because Balaam went. So the angel of the Lord stood in the road to stop Balaam. Balaam was riding his donkey, and he had two servants with him. So the king of Moab was afraid of the mixed multitude that came into the land. And he sends for Balaam, who was a known prophet of the Creator. And yes, in Hebrew, it does read, he spoke to Jehovah. Balaam had a reputation that when he spoke, it was with an authority the Moabites didn't understand yet. So Balaam speaks to the Creator. The Creator tells him not to go at first. Then when the more important representatives of the king show up, the Creator says, well, go, but only do what I tell you. So if he said go... Why is it then that the Creator gets mad at Balaam when he went with them? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. You didn't realize you had that question, did you? But I'm glad you asked it. <laughs> now, if you could read this in Hebrew, it would make perfect sense. 
But in English, it's confusing because of one word, with. He went with them. Well, what's the difference? When, when the Creator asks Balaam, who are these men with you? He uses the Hebrew word im, meaning who are these among you? But when Balaam goes with them, that word changes. Moses changes that word to et, meaning he wasn't just going along for the ride. He was going in the same spirit of these men. Balaam had become greedy. He had a change of heart. He wanted their money. He made a very bad decision. See, in English, we use the word with um, a lot. <laughs> you know, you can, you can be in an airplane with a lot of people, but it doesn't mean that you're with them. Now, you can be part of a tour group on a bus or a ship or a plane, and you're with the group, that group can be part of other tours who are on the same vehicle, but you're not with them. Am I, am I explaining this correctly? Okay, good. That's why the Almighty gets so upset with Balaam. He knows he had a change of heart. He knows that his decision was a poor one. He gets angry, and he sent a divine being that only the donkey could see at first. And finally, Balaam was allowed to see the divine being after the donkey spoke to Balaam. That was Balaam's clue. He knew that he had chosen unwisely. He understood what was going on at this point, and he figured out he'd better repent pretty fast. His choice finally was correct. It just took uh, being spoken to by a donkey. When we're faced with making a big decision or even the choices we make every day, if we incorporate the Creator's instructions, we make wise decisions. Now, some of you may be saying, well, you know, what, what if I'm at the store and I'm buying laundry soap? Does our Creator really care which brand of soap I use? Does He really care which deodorant I use? Does He really care what brand of socks I buy? Maybe. And I say that not sarcastically. We need to base our choices like the seemingly mundane things. You know, what brand of socks do you buy? What laundry soap do you use? Uh, which brand of sugar do you buy? We need to base those decisions uh, even really, with the Creator's instructions in mind. And here's why. What does the manufacturer do with their profits? If the manufacturer donates things like, donates two things, uh, like Planned Parenthood, uh, which, by the way, supports the murder of children, we should probably not purchase their products. If, if they support any of the evils in the world, we would actually all be better off if we chose a different brand. Now, are each of us supposed to take the time to research each brand of every product we purchase to be certain where our money's going? You know, well, actually searching the parent company for a brand you use is really not that difficult. And you might be surprised to find out what your purchase helps to support. 
But because I'm actually speaking to people all over the world, you know, I'm not going to take time to list every website that provides every detail on corporate donations. And even then, some corporations actually give anonymously. So it's kind of hard to tell sometimes. But if you look up a company like Johnson & Johnson or Bear, you can see you know, the, on their public relations pages usually where they donate. Some organizations have lists of who donates to them. Um, other, there are some outside organizations, but they don't keep a really comprehensive list of who gives to what. You sort of just have to take the time and if you're really concerned about these things, if you are, and, and I know people who are, and, and they look at every uh, manufacturer of everything they purchase. And we all should probably do just that. Because companies like Johnson & Johnson give equally to pro-choice and pro-life organizations. Now, that might sound a little strange, but they give pretty much equal, well, I should say it this way, they gave pretty much equally in the last presidential election in the United States to both candidates. That seems like you're playing both sides against the middle, doesn't it? But what they're trying to do is say, hey, look, we support you know this candidate over here. Hey, look, we support that candidate over there. Yeah, of course we're pro-life. Everybody loves us. But at the same time, they can say, well, we gave to Planned Parenthood. We're also pro-choice. See, we're neutral. We give equally for the most part. But when you make a purchase, part of the money that you spend on that product goes to these companies, and that's what they do with their, their profits. Um, there are companies, I wasn't going to mention this, like Verizon, who do give primarily the majority of their uh, donations are for pro-choice organizations when it comes to abor the abortion issue. Now, in 1 Thessalonians uh, 5.21, Paul advises us to test everything and hold on to what's good. Now, he writes this knowing that Deuteronomy 13 provides us with the way we're to test the prophet or a dreamer. But Paul's very careful here not to limit what we are to test. He doesn't just talk about prophets. He doesn't just talk about spirits like John warns us to test the spirits. You know, when he says, you, know, you need to understand what spirit you're encountering, right? Because if we're encountering someone who's influenced by an unholy spirit, we would probably probably be wise not to heed their advice. But Paul, you know, he realizes, I don't want to limit what you test. I want you to understand you have to look at everything. Every person you deal with, every uh, purchase you make, everything you do, you need to make wise decisions. And that's why he says it the way he says it. Peter even warns us that there are people out there who will try to make money from you, you know, because they're going to convince you you can trust them, right? <laughs> we really should not fall for false advertising. There's an old adage in the United States that says, if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Now, in the United States, we call the false advertisers snake oil salesmen, right? Where do you think we get that? Of course, it comes from Genesis 3, when the serpent came to trick Eve. You know, when, when they're selling us a product that they pretty much know doesn't work, we call it snake oil. For that reason, that's where it, we can take trace that that saying back to. <clears throat> now we're going to look. Well, I should say, Meyer's going to read just a few verses about making wise choices. 
1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober-minded and alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Proverbs 28, 15. Like a roar, roaring lion or a charging bear is a wicked rule over a helpless people. Proverbs 13, 11. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Psalms 119.9 How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. Psalms 25.12 Who is the man who fears the Lord? He, Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. So whether we're making everyday choices or once-in-a-lifetime decisions, we need to include the Creator's instruction. I really like the Psalm 25.12. Who's the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. How is the Almighty going to instruct us in the way that, that we should choose? Well, we have to be familiar enough with his word, with his guidance, with his instructions so that we carry them with us all the time. Life-changing decisions should be considered carefully. Not all of them are. Primarily, should I ask her to marry me? Yeah, that's really a life-changing decision that men will probably face at some point in their life. And, of course, the answer, the response for that is going to be life-changing as well, right? I mean, that's probably one of the biggest decisions. You know, should, should I enter into a covenant relationship with this person? Hmm, that's a good question. Have you been following the Creator's instructions up to this point? Better question. Has the other person been following the Creator's instructions up to this point? If they have been, chances are that they're going to continue to do that. If not, you might want to reconsider that relationship. And we know a lot of people who dive into these things without making that consideration. And very, very rarely is there a positive outcome. Um, Another life, well, it could be a life-changing, life-altering maybe decision. Should I take that job? Is, Is that job that's being offered to me really what I want to be doing? Is it really going to benefit the people around me? Now, a lot of times people will say, well, you know, of course it pays good. Well, just because it pays good, what are you going to have to do for it? Are you going to have to do things that will cause you to sin? Are you going to have to do things in that job that will cause you, that will demand you violate the Creator's instructions? That's something to consider. Something else to consider. Should we buy that house? You know, where should we move? Now, that's a decision that we're familiar with, right? We've been looking at this for a, a while. And it's interesting. You know, for us, we've narrowed it down to a general area. But... You know, the creator's timing is the creator's timing, right? That's it. So as we get closer and closer and, and, you know, like I said, the creator's timing is the creator's timing, but as as that timing gets closer and you you start to to see it more and more, you begin to wonder, you know, I, I know you got this, Lord, but, you know, it would be really nice to, to you know, point something, point to something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and chances are, 
some of you out there listening may have been in a situation like that. You know, Lord, I, I know you're, I know you're working in this, but it would be really, really nice if you would let me in on your plans for this. Just saying. <clears throat> There's other things. Um, some de- some decisions actually have some temporarily devastating emotional uh, trouble connected with them. Even though you know it's going to be the right decision in the long run. Even though you know you're being led to that decision because everything lines up that way. You maybe it's maybe it's a divorce. Maybe it's a medical decision. You know, you know what kind of treatment should I get for whatever ailment I may be having? Each of these decisions that we are called to make can have. This is going to sound strange, but they can have positive outcomes in a negative situation. We know people who were in a terrible marriage. But at the same time, they were afraid of divorce. We know people who were in situations where medically um, they were torn. You know, which treatment is best for me? Which direction should I go with this or with that? All of these things we can base following his instructions on. And you say, well, how do I follow the instructions for divorce? The Bible says, read my second book, God's Universe, God's Rules. You'll be surprised what I say about divorce in there. There is provisions for situations like this. Medical decisions, medical choices, what treatment should I get? What doctor should I listen to? What, you know, because quite often in the medical field, you're going to have more than one opinion or you should have more than one opinion. And you want to listen to the, to the ones who explain it, not necessarily the, the most completely, but the best way that you can understand it. At, don't be afraid to ask the questions. If you don't know, if you ask, they will take the time to tell you. And if they don't, find a different doctor. <clears throat> That's just what I'm going to say about that. Um, but things like illnesses, divorce, treatment, I want you to think about the way unbelievers face these things without the hope of any positive outcome. They have no hope. They have nothing to look forward to because all they see is the problem. They don't see the surrounding... um, What's a good word I want to use here? I don't know. But everything... There's a really odd word called penumbra that is kind of like the surrounding uh, umbrella of what's happening. And if you think about those things, because if you if you take the big picture, then you can see a little bit more clearly how the Almighty may be working in this. And when you do that, and you take His guidance then even in the midst of what seems to be right now a devastating situation or a terrible situation or a just complete, you know, it seems hopeless. But when you take in what you know about the Almighty and the way He works, you begin to see that light at the end of the tunnel. You begin to see some hope. You begin to have that glimmer of this might not be so bad after all. 
But as you're making your choices, make certain that you are founded in the Creator's instructions. And I'm going to say this 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 way: If you make sure you're founded in the Almighty's instructions, it's probably the best way to ensure you don't listen, you don't wind up listening to a talking talking donkey. And I will say this: you can take that with all the connotations that go with it. Okay. Now, if you need help understanding those instructions, go to GiveGodNani.com. There, you know, those things are there to help you uh, improve your life. They're there to help you live the way the Creator designed you to live. Use them. Turn your life around and start living the way you're designed to live so that you make wise decisions. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Thank you for joining us tonight. That's it? Wow. I think so. <laughs> okay. Thanks you again, everyone. Remember the like buttons and the share buttons. Turn on those notifications, and we will see you Monday. Or not quite see you. This is radio. You will hear us, hopefully, Monday. Hopefully, you will still choose to listen. Let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Until then, many, many blessings, everyone.